Hi everybody. Um, so, it's time we're running a couple of minutes ahead of schedule, so we're just going to roll straight into the next one. Um, implementing security policy for your Macs. Um, bit of a shorter one, this one's about 30, 30 minutes. So, um, and then after that, I'm the only thing in the way of your lunch. So, uh, just to get a kick off, just a little introduction from me. Um, there's a lot, lots of people here I've seen before. Um, I've been to coming to conferences for quite a few years, but some of you don't know me. So, uh, my name is David Ackland. I work at a company called Moof IT. Uh, we're an Apple specialist consultancy and support company based in London. Um, and we have um, around 150 contract clients um, split between uh, sort of small, I say small businesses, under like 200 user businesses where we do everything for them. So we'll do their networking and uh, email systems and Macs and everything. Um, education uh, that we've been doing for years, uh, that's lab deployments primarily, um, particularly in higher education and um, larger enterprises. So typically when they're kind of above sort of three, 4,000 users, uh, quite predominantly Windows-based, and they just don't sort of know how to do the Macs or are not really inclined to get involved in doing the Macs, they bring us in to usually put in an MDM and secure them and that kind of thing. Um, my background is uh, about 22 years now in, in Apple IT. I used to work at AMSYS um, and was involved in starting off this conference back in 2016. Um, and yeah, I've been doing kind of device management and more recently security for, for a number of years. Um, and then personally, um, in these slides, I've, I've never talked about like me as a, as a person. So I thought well, I'll just add a bit of human, human contact in there. So um, father of two, um, two little girls, one's only nine months old. So um, very sleep deprived at the moment. Um, and for those of you that have seen me before, I did used to be 30 kilos heavier a couple of years ago. Um, COVID hit and some people went down kind of the eating route. I went down the fitness route for some, I don't know why. And it panned out really well, lost loads of weight. Um, I used to be really into Taekwondo when I was younger. I got to like black, black belts in Taekwondo. Um, and then, so recently I decided to take up uh, full contact Thai boxing. Don't know why, um, seemed like a good idea. You hit 40 and you go through these kind of crises and think, let's do it. Um, so I had my first pro fight in February, which went really well. Um, didn't get hurt too badly. Um, but yeah, everyone did something different in COVID, and that was my <laughs> that was my my route for some reason. So this talk, implementing a security policy, um, as I said, we've been doing lots of device management stuff for years. Um, in the last three to four years, um, customers have been coming to us saying they want to deploy security controls to their Macs um, primarily. So it used to be kind of how do we deploy a large set of software to the Macs and how do we get them set up efficiently. Now it's how do we um, enforce security across them. Uh, so particularly the larger enterprises, security used to be put the Macs on the guest network and forget they exist. And now it's kind of, well, let's actually try and secure them, actually maybe bring them in, so maybe we'll let them print or do some other, other cool stuff. Um, so this is just, as an MSP, we've got the, the privilege of doing this lots and lots of times. So this is just how we do it. Um, I've tried to make a mental note of no preaching in this talk, so I'm not gonna say to you, this is how you do it, it's just, this is what we do, and it works well for us. Um, a quick summary of our, of our method. Um, so first of all, um, so obviously we don't just like push out a bunch of controls straight away. There's a bit of a, bit of a journey, journey through this. First of all, uh, gathering the requirements from the customer, because we're an MSP, we don't know their business inside and out. We need to kind of know, what, you know why do they want to do it? You know, what, what are they trying to achieve? Building out a set of controls that is appropriate for them. Um, Getting buy-in from stakeholders, so I'll touch more on that in, in a bit, um, is pretty important. Then comes the actual enforcement, so how do you, how do you enforce these controls across the devices? Um, and then lastly, um, this is something that's kind of, we didn't actually do straight away, we used to kind of just enforce and then go, cool, everything is good, let's, let's move on, do our stuff. But we found monitoring is quite important. Um, and then obviously reviewing and updating. Um, I saw some talks yesterday, people were saying, you, you don't just do a security policy and then that's it, leave it for five years. You've got to keep, keep revisiting it and make sure it's still relevant. Are there, are there new risks to address and so on? So gathering requirements first off. Um, first of all, um, so we're engaging with a new customer and we'd say, are, there, are you um, heavily 
in every regulated industry, or are there particular rules that you must follow? You know, do you have Cyber Essentials Plus, or I, are you ISO 27001, or some other, some other set of rules that you're, you're following? Um, because that's got to be in there straight off. There might be other things they want in there. Um, so we get a mix of companies. Um, so we get some that are heavily regulated and some that, some that aren't. Um, so determining that is, is pretty important. Finding out who the, who the key stakeholders are. So in that business, who, who's the person that's driving this? Who's, who wants this to happen? Why do they want it to happen? Uh, for those companies that aren't regulated at all, um, it's more of a, a, a personal choice for that organization. How heavy-handed do they want to be? Um, how many controls do they want, in, want, want to put into place? We normally, um, if they don't have any idea, we normally give them just a set of, you know, based on, um, you know, industry standard kind of uh, controls. Uh, we give them like a, a, a predefined list, all the obvious things, you know, uh, disk encryption, anti-malware, um, auto screen lock, that kind of thing. Um, we'll obviously talk about the users a bit, um, what has come up quite a lot of times. Um, we're doing deployments um, to teams of developers a lot more now than we used to. Uh, it seems like developers using Max is just growing steadily. Um, and they have different kind of requirements. Uh, usually taking away admin rights straight away is, is not very popular with them, we have discovered. So I'll talk more about that uh, in a while. Um, generally speaking, though, there has to be uh, some kind of why you're implementing the security policy. And for each of the controls you're putting into place, you should be able to, or the organization should be able to answer why they're putting that control in place. Um, and have some kind of thought process behind it, some kind of reason behind it. Don't just pick a, pick a bunch of controls and go, yeah, that'll, that'll do. Uh, just yeah, have, a, have a bit of a thought through it. Um, if it is because you're in a regulated industry and you have to do it, then that's, that's good enough. Yeah, that is a reason. So, Okay. So um, yeah, when we're engaging with a new customer, we, we get, get that bit done first off. Yeah, what, what controls are appropriate to them? What, what do they want? Um, most of the time, and I, I've been quite surprised by this, actually. I've gone into some really, really big, big organizations, you know, well over 10,000 users. Um, and I've said, okay, so um, what, what do you want in your security policy? And they're like, well, I don't know. You tell me. And I think, well, don't you have a, like a security team and a, all this other stuff? And when it comes to the Macs, they just don't really know um, what they want. It's quite surprising. Um, so we kind of we can break them down into there's obviously more categories than this but this is just a few examples first of all um, one of the popular areas is stopping the mac from hosting data or services so turning off the ability to turn the mac into a server so stop it from um, running local web servers local file sharing in an organization you, you should have servers that can do that kind of thing not end devices doing it um, there's a few odd edge cases, possibly again with developers, but for the most part, um, when you go into the system preferences and sharing, that kind of area should be, should be more locked down. Um, um, limiting the ways to get data in and out of Mac. So obviously you can do things like turning off AirDrop. Um, if a company uses Microsoft 365, then they're probably using OneDrive, making sure that they can't install you know, Dropbox and other, other file sharing tools. Um, protecting the Mac if it's lost or stolen, so things like file vault, uh, disk encryption, uh, making sure it requires a password when it wakes up. Some people like to do the setting, um, like enabling some of the auditing, um, the audit controls, and uh, changing some of the log settings. Um, that one, we, we don't recommend straight off the bat. We always ask the customer, what, what do you want to do with the information? Do you have some kind of process behind that? So you go through the, the you know, you've got a bad lever in the organization. They've, they've gone, you've got the Mac. Do you actually want that data or not? Because otherwise, you're just gathering tons and tons of data for no reason at all. And we've actually had some, there's some um, CIS controls, um, particularly on the auditing side, that have caused all sorts of problems where uh, like the VAR folder has just kind of filled the hard drive and gone nuts. So um, you have to be slightly careful just gathering logs for, for, for the sake of it. Um, and then protecting against malicious software. That's obviously just the anti-malware side. Um, Alex mentioned this yesterday, or raised it as a question for the panel. Um, this is obviously just a balance. Um, the more security you have, sometimes the, the less usable the device is. The most secure device, of course, is the one that's switched off, locked in a safe, but um, the user is going to struggle to do anything productive with that, with that device. So it's kind of just balancing between the two. Uh, if anyone has looked at the CIS benchmark and all the CIS controls that are available, you're not supposed to just turn on absolutely everything. And if you do, that's going to um, that machine's going to be pretty horrible to use, I think. 
Um, this is just kind of some of the examples, um, in case you're wondering. Uh, if anyone is kind of unsure of what kind of controls are available, I would recommend yeah, take a look at the CIS controls as a, as a starting point. Um, there's, there's a huge amount on there, and you can kind of have a look. They've got a nice description in there as well about um, yeah, the, the rationale behind them, you know, which, which ones provide what kind of benefit. Um, but there's, there's all sorts of things, all sorts of things you can do. Um, for the most part, when, when we're doing this, we, we normally have, you know, on the light end, we tend to have about sort of 10 to 15 controls on a Mac. Um, on the heavier end, for some customers, we have anything up to like 40 or 50 different, different security controls. Um, there's a couple that stand out that I'd say are more contentious than others, but I'm just going to dig into a tiny bit more. Admin privileges, you know, do they have them or do they not have them? So I've got a couple of separate slides just on that particularly. Um, iCloud services, um, this one is a tricky one. Um, if the company has no kind of control over the Apple IDs, uh, they're not using managed Apple IDs, they just, you know, maybe they use Microsoft 365 or they're using uh, Google or something else. Um, to provide all the services to the device. Um, you don't really want your users using personal Apple IDs, signing into iCloud Drive and syncing their desktop and documents folder. Because that data is then out of your control. And most organizations that I've come across um, have said to their clients that, yes, we know where our data is. We have control over it. Um, you can't say that if you let people use personal Apple IDs and iCloud Drive, particularly with syncing. Because they're putting company data into iCloud in a personal account. When that user leaves, they've then, they're then taking that data with them, which is not ideal. They may have no interest in it, but uh, it's a bit of a, bit of a risk. Um, managed Apple IDs are a slightly different case. Uh, so you, you could, you could take, take that route. Um, the reason I put iCloud up there is uh, we've agreed this with companies in the past. And this is where getting the stakeholders involved is important. Um, because we've then pushed out the control. The, there's a config profile option to say block iCloud Drive. Um, and then we get the inevitable call from a user that says, my desktop is empty. Where have my files gone? Because it didn't actually get communicated out to anyone, or they didn't actually fully understand what was going to happen. The first time we ever saw it, it was actually a bit of a shock. We didn't realize like, it was just going to remove everything off the machine. We're like, OK, that's a bit heavy-handed, but, but effective. Yeah, it did work. Um, yeah, when they call in and say, my files are gone, we said, yeah, that was on purpose. Sorry, um, not, not too popular. Um, software patching, um, really important with security these days. Um, you know, zero day vulnerabilities and all that kind of stuff. All the other, you know, the vendors here have all been speaking about how they're doing app patching, Mac OS patching, not going so well, but you know, we will struggle on. Um, but it's invasive to the users. So it's one of those ones, you kind of got to have a conversation with them in advance and say, we are going to do patching and we'll try and make it as unintrusive as possible, but it's gonna, it's gonna be annoying, particularly when predominantly we're talking about laptops. So the only time that it's on is when it's kind of being used. It's not like you know, the old, good old days. Um, just on the admin privileges front, so just this is the way we, we, we tackle it. So a company comes to us and says, um, you know, either we don't want our users to have admin rights or um, even in Cyber Essentials, um, just the, you know, one of the most basic um, set of controls you can have, it says users should not be running as admins um, on, uh, to do day-to-day -day activities. So if they're in the account that they're browsing the web on and getting emails and doing that kind of stuff, that account should not be an admin. Um, so there's various different ways around this. Um, our method, um, when we get asked to do this by a customer, first of all, we go through a process of uh, logging some information. So uh, using... Um, the, the built-in built -in log system. We ship logs over to a log server so we can analyze it a bit more. Um, we start off with command not dissimilar to this. We send it out in, in JSON format, but dis not dissimilar to this. Um, we put in um, various uh, exclusions because there's just loads of junk in there that we want to get rid of. Um, but ultimately, we're kind of gathering information about um, when they're entering an admin password. So whether that's unlocking a system preference, installing software, um, running sudo in the terminal, any of that kind of stuff. It all gets gathered together, logged, um, and then centralized. We do that for a couple of weeks, and then we start building into um, more useful information. So uh, this example is um, uh, Kibana visualization. So you can send this data over to Elasticsearch and then have Kibana over the top, um, and then start um, graphing the information. or Because vis vis the quantity of data, as you'd imagine, is going to be quite vast, so you just want to um, create some visualizations out of it and see, see what's going on. So you can see 
Um, first of all, who's using admin privileges um, and how often are they using it? And also, what are they using it for? Um, from that information, uh, we can do a few, more, a few more things with it. So, um, first of all, tackling occurrences in the, using your management tool. So, um, we get the data to see what are they actually using admin privileges for, and then you can start putting in um, alternatives via the admin tool. So, first, it could be software installs or something else. Authorization DB is still, still a thing at the moment, so you, can, you could let them unlock the date, you know, the date and time system preference has always been an admin level preference pane um, because of olden days and it used to be a, used to be a risk, but, um, but sometimes it goes, goes wonky and they need to you know, change the time zone or do something like that. So you can give them rights to be able to do that on its own. You don't have to just make them an admin to, to let them edit date and time. And there's lots of other areas in the OS that you can do that. Um, software additions, uh, so uh, we use Jamf um, primarily. So we go through a process of um, looking at the software that is on people's machines. Um, or multiple occurrences, you know, if there's more, more than one, one machine using a particular piece of software that isn't in Jamf, we'll go through a process of adding that into Jamf and then making it available in self-service. So it slowly starts to chip away and remove the need for admin privileges. Um, and also sudo, um, you can limit that if you want to. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um, you can edit the sudo as file and then um, say, right, they, they can't just be full out. Yeah, it don't have to be an admin to run sudo. They can run certain commands with it. So all of this is just to chip away at the reasons and reduce the number of occurrences where people need admin rights. And then once we're at that stage, we offer the, the organization has kind of three choices um, for their users um, like this. So um, they can have people just be permanent admin. That's obviously their choice. If their Cyber, Cyber Essentials accredited, then we say that is not compliant with Cyber Essentials. So do they want to give up that badge? It's kind of... That's, yeah, that's not our choice to make, that's theirs. Um, most of the time, for people that are genuinely still using admin privileges, and it's normally developers, we give them the temp admin um, capability. So there's lots of um, variations of this on the internet. Um, so it's de delivered via script, then uses LaunchD to remove it again. But basically, they click a button in self-service, it makes them an admin, then 30 minutes later, or time you've determined, it removes it again. Um, so it's pretty easy to make. Um, so that's a lot closer. Um, and then for users that you know, aren't developers, are very infrequently using admin privileges, you take them away and uh, they have to log tickets uh, to do it. Um, when we do the temp admin thing, just as in case it's useful, um, we tend to uh, tie it to a group in their identity provider, so that's Google or, or Azure. Um, so their service desk can just manage access to that button in self-service via group membership, rather than having to go into Jamf, because uh, otherwise you know, they get a user that needs the, the temp admin button um, it's a bit annoying for, for them to lock a ticket with us to go into Jamf to add them to something to do it that way. So, okay, um, buy-in from stakeholders. Just just a quick mention, but um, it's pretty important that um, they are on board with it. Um, you'll need them later on. So at this stage, where you're building the requirements and then setting it up in your management system and pushing out the controls, that's that's quite quite straightforward. But um, then when the pushback comes later on, you you will need them on your side. Um, there's different types of people. So you've got the um, uh, sort of the you know, senior management, I suppose. Um, you want to sort of tell them you know, why they might want to have a security policy. So they can reduce the risk of a successful cyber attack, um, reducing the risk of fines from the Information Commissioner's office. Um, for some smaller businesses, we found it actually helps them work with larger customers because those larger customers expect them to have some kind of a security policy. So it means they get to win bigger customers um, when they do that. Um, that's less interesting to the users, though. So with users, it's more about um, speaking to them about what, what objections they might have to certain security controls, making sure they see the list of controls in advance. Um, not every single user in the company, but just you know, keep it, you know, team leaders or, or so on. Um, listen to their concerns. Um, I mean, sometimes they just, you know, you get the odd person who says, no, I just don't, I don't want the policy on my machine. Normally the CEO, and then you just have to say, well, obviously their choice, but... Uh, they should have it. Um, and obviously, reassure them that you're going to work to minimize, minimize the impact on their, on their work. Once we've done all of that, um, we then come to the enforcement, which is actually like the technical bit, I suppose. Um, so when you talk about enforcement, there's a couple of ways in the security world they talk about it. First of all, you can have a uh, paper enforcement, but it's like, a pa just, it's like have it written down. You're supposed to do that anyway. 
um, that doesn't actually enforce anything. So it's just, you know, um, but do have your policy written down. And then the more interesting bit is obviously electronic enforcement of the policy. Um, and you can do this a few ways. You could do it manually. So you can just go machine to machine and click buttons and do stuff. Um, the user can then obviously undo it again afterwards, but um, we have seen that in, in use. And then you can obviously use uh, your MDM system. Um, you can run scripts um, or installing uh, if it's anti-malware software or DLP software and, and other things. So it's a combination of all of these things that we're, we're using. Um, so um, when you're doing this, I've got just a, a couple of examples. So obviously you've got scripts, config profiles, and software is the kind of magic triangle of how you might enforce these different controls. And you have to choose how you're going to do this. So this one's a really offensive looking slide here. Um, so this is um, managing airdrop. Um, so do you want to allow it or not allow it? Um, you can obviously push a config profile to do it. Um, or you can run a script. It's kind of up, up to you. But the, the user experience is just is slightly different. So a script will run it. Um, or, you know, in this example, setting the discoverable mode um, in that preference file. Um, and you can set it to the relevant, the relevant mode, so off or contacts only. Um, but it's a question of whether you want users to be able to change it later on. So you could have this kind of run again um, on some kind of repeating cycle. Um, or if you want it set to a particular thing, um, so on the left you've got uh, contacts only, that's set by a config profile, that will then be fixed, they, they can't change it. Um, or on the right hand side you've got a conf config profile, just disable airdrop, it's just not allowed full stop. So you've got lots of different choices and it kind of depends on how you want it to work um, with your, your users. Um, another example of that is um, in Safari, so this is a, um, a Cyber Essentials one again, um, where it's not supposed to, that checkbox at the bottom, open safe files after downloading, um, means it will, if it's ticked, it will just auto load a file when it, when it downloads from the web. Um, the other browsers don't do this, but that would be a cyber essentials failure um, if you're using, using Safari, if they had that ticked. Um, we manage it for our config profile, which does that, which it grays out the button, so the user can't enable it at all. Um, but if you do want to change, uh, have to do it a different way, then use the default write command, uh, which will set the setting, but let the user change it temporarily. And then you can run the script again to, to overwrite it. Um, we do find that certainly when it comes to like CIS controls, we can enforce pretty much everything, everything in there. Um, and it's sometimes a choice, or sometimes you can only do it with a script or only do it with a, with a config profile. Um, if anyone does download that, the CIS benchmark file, it usually has lots of example, um, example commands for each one as well, which is, which is worth looking at. So once we've got it enforced, um, and this is the bit I said, we, we didn't do this straight away, um, but we found this is, um, this is necessary, unfortunately. Um, so monitoring the state of all the devices to see how they're actually getting on. Um, are, they, are they actually compliant against the policy that we, we created? Um, this is sort of an example of um, in IT, why it doesn't, why it doesn't work. Um, you know, no reason at all. So you configure your MDM, it should work. And yeah, it's all set up, but for some reason, some devices just don't get the setting. Config profile doesn't land, the script doesn't run, yeah, or a million other reasons why it just doesn't work. And then, as it says here, then just run it again and then it does work. But that's, that's IT, unfortunately. So what do we do? Um, so obviously, when, you, when, you're, um, when you're monitoring this stuff, um, it depends what MDM you're using as to what you've got available. So you get some um, inventory data via your MDM. Some people, I don't know if anyone's like using like separate inventory tools. Um, it's normally kind of tied into the management system. Um, so certainly is the case with Jamf. Um, there's also tools like OS Query uh, that is really good at doing, doing reporting um, as well. Um, so our method um, for this, we create custom extension attributes in Jav Pro um, that read the, the particular setting that we're interested in, uh, just to see the state of it. Um, we do that even when the same value is somewhere else in Jamf um, for a particular reason. Uh, particularly, it allows us to control the output. So we like to output everything as either compliant or not compliant, and that's it. We don't want like um, some fields saying yes, no, some saying true, false, some saying on, off, and then having to kind of later interpret all of those different possible scenarios. So we, we make extension attributes for each individual security control and then manage it 
manage it that way, um, which means we get a nice long list of all the controls and then against each device it either says compliant or not compliant, which is very easy to analyze later on. Um, so just an example, I'm sure those of you that if you use Jamf, you would have seen an extension attribute before, you wrap it in these um, HTML result tags. Um, this one um, is reading the secure keyboard entry in the terminal, which is just a particular security control. Um, and it's checking if it's switched um, off, uh, then it marks it as compliant, um, and otherwise it's, it's not compliant. Um, we feed all of that into um, an Elasticsearch system, and then I use Kibana to visualize that in information. Um, obviously, because we're an MSP, this is feeding from multiple clients, we can filter down to individual clients, um, or look at sort of types of types of industries, all sorts of different ways of carving up the data, but it lets us analyze the state of the devices on mass very, very easily and spot where the device isn't compliant in certain, certain cases. So this is basically shipping that information from the j lots and lots of Jam servers into a single, uh, a single dashboard for us to use. Um, Um, we can also look at lots of other things, so we can, um, we can grab just random bits of information that's in the Jamf inventory, um, not just the EAs that we create, so we can look at uh, macOS versions, um, build versions, xProtect data, um, gatekeeper status, um, SIP status, I'm always surprised by this, like you come across, like, I don't know who the, the four people are that decided to turn off SIP, but, but we know about them, we can, we can find them. Um, so, as part of that, that monitoring, um, we have it going into Elasticsearch. We also have um, various alert triggers set up. So when there's new issues where a device goes from compliant to not compliant, um, we have that log a, t log a ticket on our um, ticketing system so our security team can take a look at it. Um, this part is the bit where you need the buy-in from the stakeholders because um, some people will go down the road of, you know, they get approval to create the security policy or get told to create a security policy. They get it set up in their management system, they roll it out to the devices, um, and then when devices aren't playing ball, um, how far do you go? Uh, what, what, you know, if you're contacting the users, what if the user just ignores you? You kind of need that buy-in from up high uh, so that they can, say, they can contact the user and say, no, you, you do need to get your device looked at. Um, so, Generally speaking, we will try and use the management tool if possible. So where we spot devices that are not compliant for certain things, we might look at how we're enforcing that setting and saying, is there anything, that, is there a flaw in the plan here? Is there something slightly wrong with it? Can we just make a little adjustment that will, that will correct it for those cases? A big example of that was FileVault. Um, we used to um, mark FileVault as required at logout. Um, I think there were actually bugs previously trying to run it at login, but we used to do it at logout, but at logout they can click cancel and they can do that forever. Or never logout is, is the, other, the other alternative. So you end up with devices that, aren't, that don't have file vault enabled. Um, so switching that to be required at login, um, if they click cancel it, it won't let them log in. So then they have to, it's kind of giving an option that's not really an option, it means they just have to click, they just have to accept it eventually. Um, and then suddenly, those few, few cases where FileVault wasn't enabled just went away. So use the management tool if we can. Um, we do um, try this as well, so asking the user where, where possible. So you, using the management tool just to display notifications in various different shapes and sizes, just to say, hey, could you, um, you know, click this button or do, do something? Um, just trying to automate that as, as much as possible. Um, as an MSP, we obviously often working with IT teams within businesses. Um, so this it reduces their work as well. Um, so they don't have to go to the user every time. Um, the last resort though is intervening. So sometimes a device is just not getting a setting. We don't know why it's not getting a setting, but the only way to find out is to get on that device. Um, that's that's the, last, the last step. Um, so, but we do, we do need that because um, you know, otherwise you're gonna get those devices to just stay, stay non-compliant. Non um, and then obviously the last thing that we will do is just review and update, um, update these, these controls. So we have, once we've got this nice process in place where we can implement the controls, monitor the state of the devices, have a response plan in place when it goes, you know, if, if devices start to wander, um, we just need to go through 
it, this is basically a repeat of the slide I had at the start. So gather requirements, building a list of controls. If there's new things you're going to be pushing out, making sure there's buy-in from the, re the relevant people, um, enforce, monitor, and go again. Um, usually like once, once a year uh, or thereabouts. Um, usually when there's a new OS uh, or a um, CIS or someone else brings out a set of you know, new controls that are available, can have, have a look at those. Okay. And that's it. That is our process. Thank you very much. I guess, um, just, are there any questions? Or is it lunchtime? Oh, no, over there. Okay. I'm on the microphone again. Yeah, so uh, on the topic of response and asking the user, what ways have you found good and effective for informing the user? Ones that don't sound fishy and you're sort of getting them to, to not update because that, that mm. looks, looks scary, but something that, that they still will respond positively to. Uh, yeah, I guess um, I guess software updates is a, is a classic one because um, we kind of need their help at the moment because management tools can't, just can't do it. I don't know whether it's Apple or you know, what's going on there, but um, so we take an approach of just being progressively more annoying <laughs> pretty much. Um, so we start off with like, yeah, there'll be just like notification center. It's like, hey, there's some updates. Could you, could you please run them? Um, and then, you know, might use Jamf helper or that kind of thing to, you know, middle of the screen, little pop-up. I'm saying, hey, you, you ignored me. And then full screen, hey. And then, and then it, so increase the annoyance and the frequency, like the visibility and the frequency progressively um, until they can say, enough's enough. I'm going to click update. Um, we, d we often get users saying how, they'll log a ticket with us and say, how do we get rid of this message? <laughs> and then, then we look at the messaging and say, we're getting something wrong here. Um, but um, yeah, it, when we, we do have enforced patching for, um, for all the software on the machines. And we've had users say, you know, um, once a month, it forces me to do patching. How do I stop that? And it's like, just run the patching yourself in advance. Because yeah, they can do it from self-service at any time. So, um, yeah, that's our method, progressively more annoying. Um, but those that play ball don't get the annoying nags. So, any other questions? Um, okay, so Cyber Essentials. Admin, admin rights, I think we've, we've answered um, how, we, how we handle that. We take it slowly, um, but get there in the end. Are you using the Privilege app? No. Um, we kind of wanted to, actually. I, I like it. Um, but I think, I mean, someone might correct me if I'm wrong. It seems like it, it, it kind of you, it sets the lock icon quite nicely. The user can make themselves an admin, but it doesn't revoke their access. Um, I don't know if that's changed. Or when I, certainly when I looked at it some time ago, it didn't seem to revoke their access. And so I was, kind of wanted something that would do, do that. In, in, I didn't really want two different things, so we just went. Oh, does it? OK. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think when when we, we the route we took like was quite some time ago, and it seemed to just kind of the user chose. So, um, if you give users admin privileges, how do you track what they've done? So we use the log to send off to a logging server, then keep keep track of the data. That also, uh, as a, a side point, actually helps us to spot future like spikes in admin usage, where if everything's kind of just plodding along quite nicely, we can spot if there's a sudden, sudden uptake in people using, using admin privileges and, privileges and look into why, and just see if we can tackle, tackle that. Um, okay. Um, what remediation steps do you take for non-compliant devices to secure your environment? So that's, again, part of the response thing. We look at MDM first and see, is there something wrong with the config that we've gone, we've used? Um, ask the, if, because for it to scale, ask the user if we can um, via notifications and so on, if it's something they can do, and then intervene, which is normally when there's something broken. You know, it might be that they're logging in, and when they're logging in, it um, comes up with the firewall prompt, they click OK, then gives them an error message and just is failing for, for some reason or another. So in those cases, um, we have to intervene. Um, cool. Um, there was one question, which, which tools could be interesting for security? Um, 
kind of pretty pretty broad. <laughs> uh, I'd say um, I know we we quite like um, logging systems now. Um, we're finding them finding them quite useful, particularly for like, data analysis and um, looking at. Um, you know, security controls, particularly as an MSP, um, because logging into individual JAMP instances to see the state of things would be would be quite quite laborious. So having it all centralised is, is really useful. Um, yeah, I know there's obviously lots of you know, next gen AV products, DLP products, all sorts of things out there. But um, yeah, probably a bit broad for me to easily answer. So anyway, that's all of those. Any other questions? Am I in the way of lunch? Yes. Cool. Thank you very much.